on to a new big topic of uh, 169, that is uh, testing. I'm a, I'm a big fan of testing, and I think uh, testing really has to be um, a very important part of any significant software project. I know that many of you uh, think that testing is boring, and uh, I believe that is uh, for two reasons. One is you have not yet seen how fun it could be to write, how fun and challenging it could be to write, uh, to write tests. Uh, far from boring in most cases. And second, in your professional experience, unless you've had internships, uh, you have not had to maintain a software for a long time. Software written by you or by, or by others. Testing really pays off in the, in the long term, so it's, it's an investment. Um, so you, I will try to explain to you uh, why that is so, and I'll teach you some techniques, but probably you will fully appreciate uh, the benefits of testing only when you, when you move on into a long-term project. Um, why do we need testing? Well, because software is buggy. This should not be a surprise to you. Um, what's surprising, though, is that uh, the number of bugs in software is fairly uh, similar across many software projects. Um, people have done studies, and they have found out that uh, in, uh, in mature software, you have uh, between one to five uh, errors per 1,000 lines of, uh, of code. Uh, I, I certainly, when I write software, I, I have more than that uh, initially. And then hopefully, by the time it gets mature, we get down to that. So in prototype software, you have definitely more than uh, Tens of bugs probably per thousand of code. Um, I have an, uh, an example for which uh, there have been published uh, n numbers. Uh, Windows 2000 had about 35 million uh, lines of code, and at the time of release, they had 63,000 known bugs. And this is at the time when they decided that it's good enough uh, to release. Uh, Windows 2000, uh, it's a bit notorious uh, because it was very late due to the number of bugs it had. So when they got to this uh, number that I believe it's definitely lower than they had before, uh, they decided to release. So that, that adds up to about two, two bugs per thousand lines. But you, I mean, finding two bugs in 1,000 lines is one thing, but finding 63,000 bugs in 35 million, it's, it's another thing. Now, of course, in that 35 million lines of code, there's uh, this code that everybody runs, probably doesn't have many bugs, and this code that only applies to very uh, strange uh, scenarios, where probably most of the bugs are. But anyway, uh, in general, 100% uh, correctness is, is really not feasible. It's very, very expensive for most projects. And for most projects, it's not even uh, uh, worthwhile to go there. So uh, nevertheless, we have to try to find as many bugs as possible. And there are many ways in which people have, have tried to find bugs. Uh, different approaches to validation. Testing is the one that we will uh, we'll look at for the next, uh, next few lectures, and is the one that I expect you will, you will use heavily in your, in your project. Testing is simply running your code on some uh, synthetic manufactured uh, inputs for which you know what the software should produce, and then verifying that indeed the software produces those, uh, um, those results. So uh, testing has the advantage that um, it's actually fairly, uh, fairly easy to, uh, to run uh, your code, especially once it's, uh, it's ready. If you have the whole code uh, done, you can, you can test it. What becomes hard is how do you run tests when you're only 10%, uh, on only 10% of the project uh, works. That's, that's where the challenges are. Let me ask you, what do you think are the limitations of testing? Why isn't testing the only thing that people have, have considered doing for validation? Uh, well, I guess your, your test can only test for so many things, so it's kind of biased, I guess. Uh, it can be at least. It only covers what you thought yeah. about, but what you didn't think about is not going to be covered. Okay, so both of you are saying that testing is not going to cover all of your program. Uh, and that's, uh, that's true. Now, people have, have 
thought of ways to kind of um, work around that. For example, random random testing. For a compiler, you write the compiler thinking about some use cases, but you can feed you know random programs into your compiler, and at least it shouldn't crash. And People are thinking of ways to do random uh, testing, fuzz testing. So there are advanced techniques. Some of them are um, a matter of research still. But definitely not very used in uh, in production. Well, let's let's uh, look a little bit at how much can you cover uh, with tests. Let's take simple cases. A program that doesn't have cycles, no loops, only conditionals. Conditionals give rise to many cases. Okay, what would you say is the number uh, for the most complicated program that one could write with uh, 10 conditionals, 10 if statements, if then else? What would be, how many tests might you need to test that? I want more people to think. There's a little program that has 10 conditionals. Uh, why do you say this? Because one of the conditionals, any uh, So is there more to it or? Yeah. Okay. The whole series? Any one of the ten could pass or any two of the ten could pass. Then, how do you interact with each other? Like if you have like ten statements, you want to check if the first and the second, if the first and the third, all the different combinations of the if statement that you know can be you know, true yes. or false, and then see how how it affects the program. Yeah, but what if uh, what if the, the program is written like this? So, the, if true, you go here. If false, next conditional. So th this this is how you write your program. So this is a way of writing a switch statement, if you want. How many cases there are? Five. Four conditionals, five cases. Okay? So this is the simplest uh, way to use conditionals. What's a more complicated way to use conditionals? They're independent from each other. Independent from each other. So, indeed, uh, you, you do something based on that conditional, and you come back. Okay? So, any of these combinations is, in principle, possible. So how many paths there are? Two to the ten. Two to the ten, yes. Which I think it's, it's where you would get uh, with that as well. Uh, okay, so exponential. Uh, and this is for the programs without loops. Programs with loops have an infinite number of paths. Okay, so don't even think that you can write uh, exhaustive testing at least with respect to uh, this kind of uh, measures. What we will do uh, in about three lectures or so, we will look specifically for how to measure how much a given testing suite has tested your program, a numeric measure. And that kind of tells you you're making progress or how far you are from, uh, from the maximum. Okay? So that's the problem with testing. It's fairly easy to get started, a uh, low bar, but it's impossible to go to the end. Um, so the other thing people have tried is uh, reviews. Reviews are actually extremely, extremely effective. And uh, what I mean by reviews is, for example, code reviews. When you commit code, uh, uh, one of your colleagues is reading over and making sure they don't spot any mistake. Uh, pair programming, this is something that uh, we haven't really uh, discussed, but it's a technique whereby uh, two um, colleagues actually sit side by side and program. One actually, one typing, and the other more kind of um, watching over, thinking, uh, thinking ahead, and then they swap roles. So it's, if you want, it's live code with you. These are all ways to kind of find bugs. And uh, they could be very effective, especially if they're done well. The problem is that they are kind of informal and uneven, uh, and it's quite possible that if one person made a mistake of reasoning, 
the other person will be led kind of down the same path, and uh, both will actually miss one one case. Yeah, that's possible too. I do want to, before we go on to discuss more about testing, I, I want to cover uh, two very powerful techniques for finding bugs. Uh, one is called static uh, verification. And uh, the word verification here suggests something that tries to be exhaustive. And in fact, static verification often tries to be exhaustive. But I do want to uh, emphasize this word static. Static comes from the compiler world, from program language world. Something that is static about a program is something that can be uh, obtained by reading the code. You don't run the code. Running the code is dynamic. Static is reading the code. So the type checker is a static analysis. It's a static verification. It verifies by reading the, the program. Okay. What do you think are the advantages of uh, writing a tool? And I'm, this is more than just a code review. This is a, writing a tool that reads your program and tries to analyze uh, all of these cases. What do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of static um, verification? There's an advantage to your type checker that you don't have from testing. Actually, more than one. It can cover almost all the possibilities. The type cover. It can cover more easily uh, more possibilities. That is that is true. Um, there could be one of these branches is if this is midnight on the uh, February 29th, there's something special. Okay? That's very hard to cover in tests. Okay? But uh, statically, you can analyze that. Or exceptional cases. More advantages. Oh, advantages? Yes. Oh, I was going to say con. OK, what about disadvantages? I was, I was going to say, like, as you change your code, the paths might change as well. Is that the problem for your type checker? What do you do? You rerun the type checker. I don't know. If you change your code, whatever you do, you have to redo. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, there's, there's a big advantage to uh, that a type checker has uh, compared to, to the tester. Imagine that you only wrote 10% of your program. It doesn't run. The type checker can type check this method, this class. Okay, you, can, you can start finding bugs before you're ready to run that code. Okay, this, is, uh, this is huge. Um, what about disadvantages? More disadvantages. OK, so uh, you have used type checkers. And that, those are the most common form of static analyzers. And uh, one disadvantage that type checkers have, they don't truly understand what you're doing in your code. They, they have some rules for uh, what they look for and what they, they, they ignore. For example, they will complain that uh, if you're trying to add a number to a string. But as long as you add two numbers, the type checker will be happy, even though those might not be the numbers you should be adding for your program. Okay, so the type checkers don't understand the true semantics of the code. Um, you can build type checkers that understand more and more of the semantics, but then they become uh, more and more expensive to run. And that's why you don't see them in languages like Java. That's where, um, what people do in research nowadays. And that actually leads me to the most powerful form of static verification, which is uh, formal verification or program verification. Okay? Uh, this is really the type checker taking to an extreme. A type checker where the types express the full specification of, uh, of your program. For example, it is possible to write down in a certain type system, more complicated than, for example, the Java type system, the property that an array is sorted. Okay? It is possible to write that down. Say, this is the type of sorted arrays. And then you take the sorting function and you say, this should have type picks an array of integers and returns a sorted array of integers. And then the type checker can actually verify that your bubble sort or your quick sort indeed is correct. 
Not that it matches types, but it produces a sorted array. However, those, uh, those uh, type checkers are not very, uh, they're kind of semi-automatic. They need help from you. Uh, the error messages are very complicated. They are very expensive to run. So people are still trying to figure out how to, how to build those. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, nowadays in, in industry, there are some static verification tools that people use. Uh, there's virtually no formal. Uh, formal proof that people use in industry, except for uh, avionics and medical devices where you have small pieces of code that you put through formal proof. Is it like big user services like security processes? People check on how NOC code is tested by these techniques, for example, or security breaches? Um, for security, you do a combination of static verification and testing, actually. Um, but I, I think I, I didn't understand the beginning of your question. No, I'm saying that, I mean, I held this type of testing more in the context of security and less in terms of, like, testing, you know, functionality. Well, yes, for security, the, the, the bugs that you may have uh, could be, uh, could have a bigger impact. Same for, uh, for systems that, you know, control devices that are very expensive. Very expensive, or maybe the life of uh, people is in danger. Uh, that's when you start to use uh, to use more of this. Uh, indeed. Okay. So essentially, what I wanted to show is testing uh, has the trouble that you may have to kind of cover an exponential, possibly infinite number of paths. Alternatives that uh, could cover um, a lot of paths very fast, like static verification, form proof. They have other problems as well. So pretty much uh, these days, we are. Uh, we're doing mostly mostly testing. And in fact, we do a lot of testing. Uh, Bill Gates, talking about the Microsoft building back in 1995, uh, was kind of complaining that 50% uh, of the engineers are testers, and the rest spends 50% of the time testing. Okay? And that's actually not far from the truth. It's not because they were writing bad code. It's because it's so hard to make sure that code uh, code is right. In some way, it's easier to actually write code. It's a lot harder to write good, uh, good code. What happens nowadays, um, I see many companies that have reduced the fraction of the engineering staff that's dedicated to testing. So if, if in Microsoft 20 years ago it was 50%, now it's maybe 10% or zero. And there's many new companies that have zero people whose job is exclusively testing. Instead, a lot of the testing um, responsibility has been pushed down to the developers. Okay. So uh, pretty much all developers spend about 50% of their time writing or maintaining uh, tests. And imagine in a company that has zero, uh, zero testers, that all the testing is done by the um, by the developers. So I'm a big fan of that kind of strategy because uh, what I have seen is if you hire people uh, for testing, they will probably spend their entire career just clicking buttons, doing a lot of manual, uh, manual steps. Partly because they are not trained as developers to automate those steps. If you give this boring, repetitive steps to an engineer, pretty soon they'll write the tools to Okay? And that's where we want to be. We don't want to spend time clicking buttons or uh, running manual testing steps. We want to program automated tests. Okay, so uh, let me let me spend a couple of slides about uh, what are these testers uh, doing. And I'll start with a uh, cartoon. Uh, let me read it off uh, for you here. Um, Radford, my company is hiring for our quality assurance group. Uh, you'd be perfect. Okay, what should I have to do? Well, you would find the flaws in our new product as making yourself an object of intense hatred and ridicule. Um, but then you'd fix those flaws, and, the, uh, and uh, the respect for me would grow into a special bond of uh, friendship, right? No, then we should. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, I, I think, an outdated uh, attitude. I personally have worked with testers uh, who I respect greatly because of the bugs they find, and not so much that they find, they find the bugs. The way they work 
So narrow down the bug to the point where uh, you give it to the engineer and it's actually easy to fix, uh, easy to understand. So uh, good, good testers are actually uh, extremely valuable. Many companies actually treat testers as first class, uh, first class engineers. And even, you see this even in titles. Uh, so Microsoft has this title, for example, Software Engineer in Test. Uh, this is a developer whose task is mostly to write testing infrastructure and, uh, and automated tests. Um, and as I said, there's, there's many companies nowadays who don't even, and everybody writes tests, and uh, there's no testers per se. Um, now, as I said, it's, it's very important, uh, it's, it's very useful typically to push down to the developers the development of, of testing and the responsibility for testing because uh, two things will happen. One is uh, they will actually be writing test infrastructure in addition to writing uh, the code. Furthermore, it turns out that uh, if you have to think about how the code will be tested while you're designing the code, you're going to be designing more testable code than if you write it thinking only how it will run in production. Okay? Then you may discover by the time you are done that the code is wired together in a way that it does run in production, maybe on a, in a data center on big machines, but you cannot run it in the small for testing on one <coughs> machine. Um, th that, those problems are very, very real. Um, so that's why it's important to, uh, to think about testing while you're developing the code. And the best way to do that is to do test-driven development, which means that the development of the code, the design, is actually driven, informed by the test you have to do. So we'll be spending a lecture next time on test-driven development, and I will show you um, live how we do test-driven development in one example. Okay, uh, several kinds of testing. Uh, and we see here on the left, we have the various stages from the software process. Looks like a waterfall, but this really applies even to agile programming. And here on the right, we have tests that match uh, various stages. Uh, at the highest level, you do requirements and specification analysis. The tests that go with that are acceptance tests. So in some way, you should write acceptance tests along with the requirements. We've gone through that. Okay. Um, now, of course, you will only be able to run these acceptance tests once, uh, once you close the, uh, the cycle, but you have to prepare them uh, ahead of time. For the various design stages, you write uh, various kind of granularities of tests. For uh, corresponding to the architectural design, you're going to write or you're going to uh, design a system test. A system test is something that puts the entire system together, a whole a real database, perhaps running on its own machine, with uh, clients, with servers, and you make sure not only that the individual pieces work together, but that they actually talk together uh, as, as required. And this is perhaps where you will be doing your performance test as well. Um, then you have integration tests, module tests, and unit tests. Um, and they correspond to kind of lower and lower um, finer and finer granularity of your code. One thing that uh, it's, um, it's actually somewhat vague is what is the exact border between a unit test, a module test, and an integration test, uh, and so on. So I personally, uh, in my work, I don't call, I don't use the terminology of module tests. Uh, we have unit tests and we have integration tests. Integration tests, uh, as soon as you put together more than one piece uh, of your system and run more than one piece together, uh, perhaps you should be called some sort of an integration test or functional uh, test. Okay. The good uh, the good news is that the techniques that you use for unit testing and integration testing often are very very similar, because even small things it may be a function. Uh, in order to run, it may require other functions. So it's some, even though you're only testing a small function, perhaps you need to integrate it with, uh, with more of your code uh, to test it. Uh, let me uh, just summarize them uh, briefly, and then we're going to spend the rest of the lecture talking about uh, unit testing in more detail. 
So unit testing is typically um, focused on verifying a single method or um, sometimes uh, you know, a pair of methods in a class. And uh, you should write as many unit tests as possible because the smaller the granularity of the test, the, the, the clearer what the test should do, the easier to debug. Uh, and when the test will fail six months down the road, it's gonna be very easy to know what's broken in your code because the test only looks at very small parts of the code. Unfortunately, uh, there's only so much you can test by looking at one piece of code at a time. Most of the bugs actually lie in interactions between components. So we actually spend most of the time writing functional and or integration tests. These are uh, running more than one component along with their interaction. And these are the these two are kinds of tests. This is what most uh, most teams would expect uh, the developers to actually take care of fully. Um, once you get to system testing, uh, that sometimes becomes hard for an individual developer to do because this may require deploying to a, a cluster of machines, uh, setting up machines in a certain way that maybe is beyond the reach of an individual developer. But these two, this should run uh, on the development machine at any time. System testing is where you do also performance testing. Performance testing by its very nature requires a large scale. So either uh, um, many machines uh, and a lot, of, a lot of load. So typically you can't do that on one machine. Um, at, at Conviva, this is what we're using uh, dedicated uh, uh, test teams to do. Um, with developers take care of all the unit testing and functional integration testing, and pretty much we find most of the bugs in here. But if somebody needs to run a longevity test for 24 hours with a lot of load on the machine to verify you know, if the memory usage increases or something happens, that's when we have a, dedicated, uh, a few dedicated engineers that have big clusters to run it on. Okay, so these are the three uh, granularities of, of testing. There's also acceptance uh, tests. These are mostly run by, um, uh, we have manual testing, uh, not the team, but a few people who do uh, manual testing, and our pro uh, product manager often, before the release goes out, will do acceptance testing against the, against the requirements. Uh, at an orthogonal kind of dimension, there's regression testing. But regression testing can be at the unit testing level functional system. Uh, or anything. Essentially what this does is uh, as you gain more experience with your project, you find more and more uh, bugs which you record in your database and you extract regression tests uh, for each. So you make sure that a bug that you had you know, uh, two releases ago doesn't appear again. Because if you don't do that, um, chances are they'll come back. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's get moving into into unit testing. I I assume that uh, all of you have used unit testing to a, a certain extent, but I want to make sure you understand even the finer the finer points. So I will cover in principle uh, the X unit family of testing frameworks. This X really is a placeholder for uh, your choice of language. The first one that was created was SUnit for small talk in 1989 by a guy named uh, Kent Beck, who is actually pretty famous in, in software engineering. He is uh, credited for a lot of the a lot of developments uh, of uh, agile programming and uh, design patterns and, and so on. So he designed SUnit, uh, a small testing library for small talk. And um, it was designed in such a way, well, first off, it's actually fairly simple in, in principle, but it was designed in a way that the principle is language independent. And people have taken it and have, um, um, have created, have implemented the, the framework for other languages. So JUnit, um, the Java one, was, uh, was created somewhat, uh, somewhat later, maybe 10 years later or so. Um, and nowadays we have actually about 70 versions of this XUnit test framework. And the good news is that if you learn one of them, it's pretty easy to pick up another one because the concepts are fairly simple and similar 
across languages. In fact, uh, I have built uh, uh, a couple of these for languages that didn't have them uh, when I had to do programming those languages. It only takes a couple of days to do it. There's a nice quote that I like here from another uh, famous person in software engineering. So, Never in the annals of software engineering was so much owed by so many to so few lines of code as the, uh, this, this testing framework. Because it's actually not, not very big, but it's very powerful. Um, one thing I would like to uh, point out for the rest of this lecture and um, a couple more lectures that come, there's a very, very nice uh, textbook by uh, Mesarosh, uh, X-Unit Test Patterns. It's a thick book, as you may, you may uh, think, why, why didn't a thick book for something so simple? It's not the framework itself, it's what, how you can use it that's actually quite, uh, quite interesting. So I'll be using this, uh, this reference, and I will make references to the reference by these initials UTP. Uh, you'll see that in my slides, UTP uh, chapter five, chapter six. So if you want to follow up and read some more about these techniques, uh, I invite you to, to pick up this book. It's really a very nice book to have as a reference. Okay, let me uh, introduce some terminology here that we'll use for a couple of lectures. When we test something, uh, we will refer to the portion of the code that is actually being tested uh, as the system under test. Okay, uh, so this could be a method, could be a, a bunch of methods in a module, it could be a, a bunch of modules, a bunch of components together. But are the, the components that are being tested? Um, this terminology distinguishes this portion of the code from auxiliary code that you need to run the test, um, which we are going to call as dependent on component. So this is another component of your software that is needed to run the piece that you want to test. Uh, to give you an example, uh, you want to test a method in a class. Well, you need to use the constructor of the class uh, first before you can even run the method. So the constructor becomes the dependent on component for this particular test. And the method is the system under test. For another test, you're testing another method. So you have another system under test, perhaps with the same dependent on component. Sometimes you swap the roles. Uh, you're testing, uh, um, if you have two methods that depend on each other, uh, you write one test for one end side of the pair, and one test for another side of the pair. It's important to know which is the component that is under test, because the assertions that you write typically are aimed at the particular component, even though you need the rest to just you know, get things moving. OK? Um, another example I give here, uh, as depending on component, is a database. Let's say that you want to write tests for your uh, Rails backend. Perhaps the system under test uh, is the model, or the view, or the controller. Uh, but to even kind of get it started, you need a database. You're not testing the database. You need it, though. Okay? It's important to keep this in mind. Together, these two, along with the input, uh, creates a test fixture. The test fixture is whatever you need to run the test. And uh, <coughs> this includes what you're testing, but it includes other stuff as well. Coming up with a test fixture is, uh, is not easy. It's sometimes uh, very very tricky depending on how how these things depend on each other. For example, if you write your code to talk directly to the database, okay, and, and the code is a mix of logic that you wrote with communication to the database, it's very hard to actually run this code with a fake database or with a fa different database for testing. So you kind of have to run the whole package together. And to test, you know, a hundred lines you have to also include another 100,000 lines of, of database in your test. Isn't it better practice to use like a mocking framework? Yes, uh, in, indeed. So we'll talk about mocking in maybe two lectures. We'll spend the whole lecture on, on mocking, uh, where you kind of separate. You cut this link here and you replace your dependent on components with some uh, faster, uh, more predictable uh, mocks. Okay. Um, 
Now, once you have the fixture, we're going to write our tests in what are called test methods. And you're going to have several test methods, each one uh, directed at a, perhaps a different uh, system on the test, different method perhaps you're testing. Um, or maybe several test methods for the same system on the test with just different inputs. Uh, and then we collect the methods in what's called a test case. Okay? So this is terminology from, from X uh, unit. So, so generally, the test case is a collection of test methods. What is uh, uh, the way you think about this is that you write one test case, which typically is a class, including several methods, um, for all the tests that share the same kind of setup. So uh, the same kind of system on the test, the same kind of dependent on component, you collect them all in the test case, and you write the code in the test case here, shared code, that will, uh, will set everything up. And then the test method goes on to actually run and assert on the system on the test. Okay, uh, let's, uh, so I have next a next, uh, a nice sequence diagram for how the X unit, um, um, for the sequence of steps in a, in a test, but uh, let's take a break here. Uh, a few things that you should know to write good unit tests. So I'm, I'm going to show here the interaction between the unit test uh, framework. This is the library that comes typically with your programming language. In, um, for, uh, for Python, it's called unit test. Uh, for Java, it's called JUnit, uh, and, and so on. This is the test case. This is the actual code that you write for testing, uh, specifically for testing. This is where your, your testing code is written uh, in this class. Uh, that's a subclass of the test case class. And uh, we'll also have here the system on the test and the dependent on components. And they all will interact uh, in, in a certain way. So first, uh, we'll, I'll show you how to run two tests, test AAA and BBB. And I want to show that there is some sort of uh, similarity between uh, tests. So the first thing that, uh, that happens when you invoke this uh, test, the unit test framework. So the unit test framework, if you want, is the main, is the entry point to your testing. And it will uh, first figure out which test needs to be run, and then goes uh, over each test in turn. And for each test, there's a sequence of steps that are followed. So first, uh, this will instantiate uh, an instance of this uh, test case uh, class. And there's nothing you need to do here. Uh, it's, it's all uh, done for you. Uh, however, you will write, um, okay, moving along, and that's uh, next, once you have an instance of this class, the test framework will call the setup method on your instance. And setup method is something you're supposed to write. Okay? And it's a shared method, typically, uh, by all the test methods in a, in a case, and it's the method that actually puts together the fixture. Uh, starts up your system on the test, the, the collaborators hook them up together. Okay? And typically this involves uh, constructing or setting up the collaborator, the dependent on component. Let's say this is the database. So uh, you initialize the database or create a table, empty, prepare it for, uh, for running the test. And then typically you create, you instantiate the system on the test. You have to do this typically in, in this order because uh, the system on the test needs to have a reference to the collaborator before you can create it. Okay? And once, uh, once all of this is done, the setup stage has finished for the test, and now you can actually start exercising this, uh, uh, this system that you put together. So um, what happens is the test framework will call this method called test AAA. So this is a method that you uh, wrote. You pick these names, and in most uh, this, of these frameworks, as long as the name of the method starts with test, uh, the test framework is going to figure it out and say, well, this is one test you want to run. Uh, but it's important to remember that before the test runs, the set that, uh, setup runs. And this is code that you write here to make calls to your system under test. Um, and while you're making these calls, the system under test will interact with your collaborator. Now, uh, let's say that you, it's, it's writing to the database and it's reading to the database. In some ways, 
this is part of the test. These are outputs from your system on the test, whatever it sends out. Uh, and it's receiving inputs from the database. Or maybe it's making a web request to a web API. That's an output. Okay, sending some data maybe, or sending just some request, and this is an input. So notice how your system on the test is getting inputs from more than one place. Not just from you, from the test, but it's getting inputs from this, uh, from this collaborators. And that's what sometimes makes it hard to control uh, these inputs. And then typically, uh, the test will, uh, towards the end of the test, you'll, you'll make calls to your system on a test to collect data on which you want to make assertions. Uh, collect the results, perhaps, of this work. And then uh, you, you write these assertions, um, and that kind of ends uh, the verify stage of the test. And then the test returns. So notice, test starts here and returns here. It typically has two stages, exercise and verify. This is where your assertions are. And then uh, the system, the test framework, will call this method called teardown, which you can optionally implement. And teardown, teardown should really mirror setup, except in reverse. It should kind of uh, undo uh, all of this setup. So it will typically destroy or clean the system under test and then the dependent on components. The idea is, okay, and then teardown completes. And then the whole, the whole test has completed. So this is the life cycle of the test. Even though very often you put your energy into writing this part here, the test, you should know that there's a setup stage and a teardown stage. The important thing to remember is that teardown and setup are run for every test. Okay? And the idea is that a test should leave the system in a clean state for the next uh, test. And that's why, for example, we destroy and clean the, the database. Okay. Any, any questions? No. Yes. Did you just say that uh, teardown is usually like automated for us? Like we don't have to do it ourselves? Um, the, the way you think about it is that um, whatever <laughs> setup does, teardown might have to undo. So if you, uh, you, you don't have to have a setup. You don't have to have a teardown. If, if, what you're, if for this test, uh, everything is very simple, if it's really a unit test. Okay? But if you need to put something in setup, then uh, some of those things may need a counterpart in teardown. Uh, for example, let's say that um, setup will create some files on the disk ready for the test to use. Okay? Then teardown should really be deleting files. You should not leave behind any garbage. You should not leave behind anything that may affect the uh, next test. So I thought that each test case is like a separate environment where like every time you run the test, it, it kind of just cleans it up afterwards, right? Or it's the setup and teardown that do it for you. Okay. Now, if you are, uh, let's say that you are in uh, Rails or in Django and you're using their test framework, which is really a, a special version of the generic Ruby unit test or Python unit test, then in Django, they have written some setup for you. Uh, that will create an, a new test database, empty, with the tables created, but no data in them. And they've written a teardown that will clean them up. If you need to do anything else on top of that, you should clean up after yourself. Okay? For example, if you need to create files that are specific uh, for your test, you should, you should uh, remove them. Okay? And, uh, and then the next test come, and the same thing is repeated. So the important thing to remember is that setup runs before every test. It doesn't just run once, and then you run the test. Every test runs setup and setup. Um, OK, so, uh, so typically you write the tests in a class in object-oriented languages, and uh, you can override the setup and teardown methods. Uh, I'm saying override because these methods exist in the super class, this test case class. Uh, and they do nothing, typically. Uh, but if you need, uh, you, can, you can override them. And then you add to the class the actual test methods. In most languages, if you start the name of the method with lowercase test, and then whatever you want afterwards, 
is going to be collected as a test to run. And typically, they'll run in alphabetical uh, order. Many languages that have annotations give you a bit more flexibility. For example, this is in JUnit. In JUnit, uh, you can pick the names of the tests however you want without this test uh, prefix, as long as you put this annotation <coughs> next to it to say, this is an actual test. And you have to do this because your test class will have set up, tear down, tests, and helper methods. You may have helper methods, something that's used in multiple tests. It's not the test per se. Uh, per se. So that's how the unit test framework will find the methods. I remember there was a, there was a question on Piazza when you had to write functional tests, um, how, how the test framework finds them. Have any, any questions? So typically, these test methods do not have arguments, okay? because the test framework invokes them uh, and doesn't have arguments to pass them. So they should actually prepare everything they need internally. Okay, so uh, let's look at a couple of uh, examples of, uh, of unit tests to see some of the techniques that you could use. So this is how it looks in, in Java. Uh, you see this test case? This is a typical name. This is provided to you. It comes with a testing framework, and you are supposed to write subclasses uh, of this test case. And in fact, this test framework comes with tools that will harvest, will go over the, all the files in your project and find all the subclasses of test case, and that's how they collect what tests uh, to run. Uh, this is the name that you pick, uh, vector test, and uh, presumably this is a uh, a collection of tests for the vector class. Um, okay, so one technique that I use, uh, I name my test classes um, using the the name of the class I'm testing, following by test. If you do it like this, then uh, in an alphabetical listing, I see the class with the test class, one next to each other. It's it's convenient. I find it convenient. Uh, the test case, you may want to have these uh, uh, instance fields uh, like fmt and ffool, which uh, they'll be set up in the, in the setup. But keep in mind that every, uh, every test will have to run setup. So it's the setup's responsibility for initializing these uh, for the for test. <coughs> So uh, typically, uh, there's a constructor that's implicit. We don't typically use constructors in, uh, in X unit. And the reason, presumably, uh, I think might be that in some of these languages, some of these 70 languages to which um, the framework has been ported, there are, there's no notion of constructors. So they have explicitly created this setup method with a very clear name that's the same across many languages. Uh, where you are supposed to do your initialization, as opposed to relying on the constructor. If this were a framework specifically for Java, one could imagine putting this in a constructor, but it's not. Um, okay, so this setup method, what it does, it prepares an empty vector and a vector named fool to which it adds uh, it adds three elements. So. Presumably, you're going to write several tests that use, make use of these two vectors. And you start them all, you initialize them all in the same way uh, for all tests. Okay? So this is actually quite, quite common. So notice that this is a, these are unit tests for the vector class. Vector class doesn't have any dependent on components. So there's nothing really to set up in terms of a fixture. Nevertheless, you are still preparing, if you want, inputs that are common across many, many tests. Uh, as, as opposed to, you know, copying this code in every test uh, folder. So one thing, one technique that's actually quite useful is um, you may be tempted to construct a complicated input here uh, with complicated numbers, thinking that maybe you are going to find more bugs if these numbers are more complicated. Uh, I generally try to find the simplest setup that's going to allow me to exercise the corner cases that I want. And for example, I prefer smaller numbers because when I'm debugging the test, it's easier to think about them, easier to spot them in the test output, as opposed to putting some ran random looking numbers here. Um, 
sometimes when I when I do uh, interviews and we discuss a programming problem, at the end I ask, uh, so how would you test this? How many tests would you write? What kind of test data would you would you have? And and some uh, <coughs> some people. No, they, they exaggerate here. Oh, I'm going to have a thousand integers uh, with you know, random looking values because then I'm going to be uh, covering more uh, cases. Well, but debugging a test with a thousand integers, it's a lot harder than with three. And actually, most of the corner cases you can exercise with three. So try to keep your test as simple as possible, um, having in mind the corner case that you are, you are actually attacking. And here's an example of a test. Uh, so it starts with the name test, and presumably I'm, I'm testing the capacity uh, feature of my vector class. Um, and uh, notice that I'm starting the test assuming that full is initialized as before. Um, however, for this particular uh, test, I'm adding 100 more. Again, this is exaggerated. You don't really need to add 100 to test that the size works. Uh, um, Okay, so I'm adding more integers uh, to it, and then I'm asserting that the, uh, the size, essentially I'm testing that the size grows as I'm adding integers in the, in the vector, okay? And again, I should not have used hundreds here. Uh, one would have been enough to verify that the size grows. But you're uh, checking, I mean, you're checking basically for the same condition every, every loop iteration, which is kind of weird, right? No, 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 sorry. Um, uh, the, the loop should only has one. Should uh, be an I, right? With uh, so true instead of hundred. No, this is not in the loop. The assert. The assert is not in the loop. It's oh, after no. the loop. So I'm adding a hundred elements, then asserting. Okay, I should have just added one. Um, but uh, one point here is that um, I, I put some common setup in the setup method, and then each test has does more setup before it can do the assert that it actually. Uh, carries out. Okay, so this is uh, the verify uh, stage. All of these X unit libraries come with a pretty rich collection of assertions, and we'll, we'll talk some more in a few in a few minutes. Okay, actually, let's talk about assertions now. Uh, there's a there's a certain uh, technique for writing these assertions, even though it seems like such a boring uh, thing. If you write this assertion, assert true is the basic assertion, and we'll uh, we'll evaluate this expression. And if it's true, it moves on. If it's false, it aborts the test. And it prints this. Assertion failed, gives you the line number, and it tries to be helpful, and says expected true, but was false. Uh, OK? And uh, imagine that you run this test in an automated setup, and you get email like this. Uh, you know, some, some of your colleagues has, has changed this uh, size method. And you are the owner of this code, so you are getting an email with this message. And so you look at it and say, wow, clearly the test failed, but this, there's no indication here of how it failed. So clearly this number is not equal to that. But is it because the size is too small or too big? We don't know. Okay? So that's why there are many assert uh, methods. And pick the one that's most precise for your needs. Uh, a very common one is assert equal, or sometimes called assert equals in some languages. And to this one, you give the two sides of the equality. So you don't put the equality in the expression. You let the assert function do the comparison. And this will allow the assert function to print this message. It expected 103 and was 102. This is a much better message than above, because it tells you that you're losing somehow. You're losing uh, values. The size is too small, and it's small by one. And that might actually give you enough hints for knowing where to look. Even better, these assertions uh, can take messages. So take the time to invest in writing this longer sentence as opposed to that, because the message is going to be uh, more clear. It says new length, which it takes from here, was expected 103, which is this but was 102. And if you get lots of these, it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on than going to the line numbers and so on. Okay? So um, questions? There are literally tens of these assertions that come with these libraries. So uh, look through them and use the one that's uh, most helpful. But sometimes, um, and for, this is an example. Um, Equality 
approximate equality, okay? Assert almost equal. You give an expected value, a found value, and a gap, and it's going to do this kind of range uh, comparison. Because sometimes you're not sure, the test is a little bit uh, non-deterministic, and you're not sure exactly what the value would be, but you know it should be within this, uh, this range. And feel free to invent your own assertions that are maybe specific to your, to your problem. Um, so, for example, if you want to look for this uh, uh, needle in the haystack, you look at that this string appears in this output, let's say, you can write an assert string contains. This one can give you a nice error message when it tells, say, oh, I'm looking for this, and you gave me this, and it's not there. And if you see the, the string you're looking for and the string that the actual output, you may figure out exactly what the error is. Perhaps you're looking for something too specific or something wrong, or it's perhaps uh, written with different capitalization. If you use something like this, it's going to say expected true, but was false. So you have to you know, fire up a debugger to figure out what's going on. Um, OK, so that's, that's about the searches. Actually, uh, incidentally, a search string contains is part of every every of these excellent libraries. But sometimes you need something that's really very specific to your project. Um, so how do you write these tests? Typically, you write one test per, per method or one test per, uh, per case, per use case of a method. Uh, for example, this one is, is testing the clone method. You're cloning the full, and you verify that it has the same size, and you verify that it has integer 1. Now, as you can see, these assertions are partial. You're not, you don't assert here everything that you know should be true, because you're not asserting that uh, it contains two or three. You figure out if there's a buggy clone, probably you'll catch it like this. If you don't, later on in the life of the project, there's another bug that you find in production that's not cut, uh, covered by your test. Then you expand your tests uh, to make sure you cover that, that bug as well. Um, very often, um, you may want to write separate test methods for the different cases that you want to you want to test. So here uh, we are. Um, okay, I'm missing a dot uh, dot clone here. I'm trying to, to clone the, an empty vector and verify that the size is zero. Um, but sometimes what I do. I actually put multiple assertions and multiple um, multiple cases in the same method. This is uh, because I don't want to have you know too many too many test cases, and I, I want to kind of take advantage of the setup uh, in one test case. What do you think is the disadvantage of putting multiple assertions in one test? Which, by the way, some people say you should never do. I should really have one assertion. One more people to think. You for example. Yes. Um, well, if one fails, then you want to uh, test these afterwards. Exactly. So if you put here 10 assertions, the first one that fails <coughs> will abort the test. And you won't know what happens with the others. So maybe the damage is a lot bigger than you think, because all of the others will fail, or maybe not. That's information that you have before starting to debug the code. If you understand when it fails and when it doesn't, already allows you kind of uh, hone in onto the actual problem, okay? So uh, cascading failures, debugging test uh, failures is a problem. Nevertheless, I very often put multiple uh, assertions that are kind of related in one, in one test case. Um, okay, so for example, it's, it's okay to actually change the, uh, the setup. The, the, the inputs that were prepared for you in setup. So this test, for example, removes all the elements from food. And the reason this is OK is because the setup method will be run again for the next test. So all tests are guaranteed to start in the same state. Uh, even if one test happens to mess with, uh, with the actual state. This is very important. One of the worst things that can happen to you is to have a test that passes when you run into an isolation. So you are in your workstation, in the debugger, you right click on this test, the menu comes up and says run this test. You run this test, it passes. And then when you run them all together, 
This happens to run after another test and leave some garbage behind, and it fails. It's, it's very hard to figure out this kind of dependency between tests. So try to make your tests independent of each other. <coughs> as, you, as you write tests for the common cases, uh, you will, at some point, have to write tests for the error cases. So for example, the element at method of a vector. We all know what it should do uh, when you're looking for an element that exists, right? But you have to verify that it works properly, even you know if you invoke it uh, with the wrong arguments, because that's part of the specification of the method. So unfortunately, this is somewhat tricky to do. This is a test that um, invokes element at with an index that's one too big. Okay? And the specification says that it should raise an exception. However, the test should pass if the exception is raised, and the test should fail if there's no exception. So you have to kind of revert the normal uh, behavior. The way you do that is you put a try-catch statement, and if the execution if the exception is not raised, the execution comes here, and then you call this built-in method called fail to say, well, I should, have, I should have seen an exception, and I didn't. And then you're catching the exception, um, and then if you catch the exception, then the test is OK. okay? So this is a very common pattern that you will see. But you have to be careful. Sometimes, sometimes people are lazy, and they're saying catch exception. And as long as any exception comes, the test will pass. But what if there's an assertion failure? Well, the, um, then the test should fail. It's only the specific exception that's OK. So be very tight uh, to the exception you're catching, because otherwise you'll be masking your real test failures. What's yeah. the point of testing for array index out of bounds? Because isn't that something that it's like part of building the job, right? Uh, well, I'm testing this, uh, this, this exception. Well, I'm not sure if it's built in Java. Let's say it's an exception that is part of your uh, your specification. Whoever told you to implement this vector class told you that it has to raise this specific exception if you're indexing out the box. You're not testing the Java system. You're testing your vector class that it raises the proper exception. So you would only need this if in your spec you specified that yes. you want it. Yes. Yeah, this is part of your spec. And very often in Java and other languages, you see uh, the value the function should return and the exceptions it should raise in, in what conditions. And that's something you have to test. Very often people only test for the positive, for the good cases. They don't test the, the error cases. But those are just as important. And unfortunately, they are harder to test. As you can see, it's, it's a messier, uh, messier setup. Okay. So this brings me to the question. What happens if, uh, if a test raises an exception? Either because the assert equals fails, that's an exception, or perhaps your code runs into a null. Okay. What do you think happens? The question is easy. Then. Everything stops at that point. Yes, the test aborts, the test fails. However, it's not quite true that everything stops. Because remember, this test framework is built to run many tests in sequence. So it has to be careful to catch all of such exceptions and only fail this test and move on, clean up, and allow the other tests to run in a clean state. You don't want, if you have 100 tests, to abort on the first, on the first test that fails. So this is actually uh, part of the <coughs> of the complexity of X unit, okay? So if you look at X unit, it's something of this form. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's essentially this. It runs the setup method, then it runs your test method in a try-catch statement, and any exception whatsoever that comes out of, uh, of your test case, uh, the test aborts. Otherwise, it, um, it succeeds, okay? Well, even this is not. Why, why do you think it's actually more complicated? Doesn't have to tear down. Doesn't have tear down, and there's one more. That I'll get to that next, I guess. And there's one more reason. If you look at this code, uh, it's not quite safe. 
just catching a general exception. It just catches a general exception. Now, that actually is okay because the convention is that the, a test, if it throws any exception whatsoever, the test should be considered failed. Okay? That's true regardless of like what it tests. It's enough that it has finished running if it turns true. But that's okay because uh, I should have been clear. This test contains assertions. The assertions result in exceptions, okay. which will be taught here. So this catches all the assertion failures and whatever other exceptions you may have in your job. But it's unsafe because of setup. Setup is a method that it's not written in the test framework. You write it. So if this throws an exception, the whole thing messes up. So there's actually a try catch around the setup. And then there's a there's a teardown, which I'll go I'll go next. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. I'm uh, kind of running low on the uh, review. Yes, I'll, I'll do the review in just two minutes. Let me go quickly over the teardown because it's the last important part. Uh, but it's one that you have to be very careful. And I'll, I'll demonstrate it to you through the five examples. <coughs> Imagine that you write a test that uses two resources here. Maybe it's a connection to a remote server. Maybe it's a connection to the database uh, that requires some, some uh, setup stage. So you write the setup to create two resources. You acquire them. And then you write the test like this. Use F, use B, and then release F, release B. The big problem that we have here is that if there's any exception in this part of the test, the test will abort and will not um, call the release functions. And this may actually leave the system in an, in an uh, unclean state for the next test. And your next test will start to fail. To give you an example, at Conviva, we acquired connections to a streaming server that we use for tests uh, to stream video to our tests. We only have a license for 10 connections on the server. So if you have a test actually acquires a connection and doesn't release it properly, pretty soon the 10th test down, they'll run out of licenses. They won't be able to get, uh, to get started. So you can have massive test failure. It's because the test hasn't been up. So you may think of actually writing code like this, saying try and then use a finally clause to ensure that if an exception is, is uh, raised here, then, uh, then you're actually releasing the resources. So that's actually somewhat, somewhat better, but still not perfect for various reasons. One is, what if an exception happens on releasing F? Okay? Then you don't get a chance to release B. Um, so, uh, plus, um, this kind of pattern is so common in XUnit uh, framework that uh, the XUnit framework provides this teardown pattern for writing this code. So, generally, you would write it like this you acquire resources in setup, and you have a matching release code in teardown. So remember, as I said, teardown should match uh, setup. And then you let the test focus on, on what it actually has to do. And the test framework will take care of making sure teardown is, uh, is involved. OK? So let me, let me stop here. Uh, and um, let's, let's do the, the feedback. And next time, we'll, uh, we'll continue. OK?